Welcome back. In a moment, we'll continue our discussion on nuclear doctrine and war. But first, here are some other stories to keep an eye on. President Widodo has called for calm after twin suicide attacks killed three police officers in the Indonesian capital of Jakarta. Over the past 18 months, there have been a series of attacks claimed by Daesh. Up to 400 Indonesians are suspected to have joined the group in Syria. Taiwan has simulated an invasion by China during the country's annual military exercise. The Defense Ministry has warned of a rising threat from China, which still sees self-ruling Taiwan as part of its territory. Taiwan's president says the country is ready to defend itself should there be an invasion. Thousands of people are fleeing the Filipino city of Marawi as government troops continue their fight against militants who have captured large parts of the area. Fighting erupted on Tuesday after security forces arrested a member of the infamous Abu Sayyaf kidnap for ransom gang. More than 100 gunmen responded to the raid by burning buildings in a standoff with police. And back now to our conversation about the risk of nuclear weapons being used in a modern conflict and how prepared are we for what that might mean. Still with us is the executive director of the British American Security Information Council, that's Paul Ingram, and also the former senior officer in the Royal Air Force, Afzal Ashraf. President Obama, we're going to rid the world of nuclear weapons. One of the first things he said in a trip to Europe when he came to office, was it lip service or was it just failed American commitment? Well, it was certainly a genuine uh, desire on his part. He had a history before becoming president of an interest in this area. Um, but it's not such a, a massive change or shift uh, in government policy. I mean, every government with nuclear weapons has a policy of working towards a world free of nuclear weapons. But why it's, say it if you don't really mean that it's attainable? I mean, what they're it's, saying is let's reduce nuclear weapons. Yeah. That's more realistic. Well, it is more realistic, but they, but actually legally they are required under the Non-Proliferation Treaty to have the intention of getting rid of them eventually. Uh, they need to stop the nuclear arms race and they need to disarm to zero. That is the commitment. They are legally obliged to do so. And if they were to state, as the current Trump administration is considering under its nuclear posture review to say actually this is no longer an, an objective. It would be seen across the world as, as perhaps realistic on the one hand, but on the other hand a complete abrogation of the non-proliferation treaty, which is the cornerstone of the international community's response to the challenge of nuclear weapons. I mean, to some degree that's what Trump is saying, isn't he? Well, in some, uh, I think Mr. Trump is not too dissimilar to, to Mr. Obama in that both of these presidents have lacked an understanding of the political system. And this is one of the reasons why Mr. Obama came with some very idealistic and very attractive ideas and he was not able to deliver because he didn't understand until he got into power what the mechanisms were. One of the big problems here is not... Well, I mean, at the same time, if I, I don't want to interrupt you, but at the same time Trump has said things like, you know, you want a nuclear arms race? Do you want an arms race? Let's go. I mean, in, in essence. And, uh, I mean, <coughs> those kind of remarks kind of throw the gauntlet down to the Russians. That's how they're perceived in Moscow. And, 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 and that is very true because Mr. Trump is reflecting the reality of the situation. And the reality of the situation is the world international system is based on the balance of power. And the balance of power uh, cannot be adjusted uh, unless there is a coordinated uh, multilateral uh, disarmament process. And it, that in turn affects the way international relations are done. So we've got the Security Council. Uh, one of the reasons why the UK has the Trident system um, is so that it can have a seat on the Security Council. The myth uh, that's been created of an independent nuclear deterrent is nothing but a myth. It is not a reality. It's inconceivable that the UK will independently use its weapons. The Americans would never allow it. And so the problem is that to be a power in the world, to have influence the world, you need power. To have ultimate power, you need nuclear weapons. And until we change the system of international relations, I'm afraid nuclear weapons are a symptom rather than the cause it of the way we have the system. It comes down to a discussion of numbers. 
but it also comes down to a discussion now and a very active one, Paul, in the United States about the renewal of the, the mm -hmm. whole uh, mm -hmm. nuclear basis in the United States. They're going to spend a trillion dollars over some 30 years mm -hmm. on a triad. What's the triad and what decisions are they making? So the triad is, is basing their nuclear weapons uh, on submarines uh, in the air on aircraft and uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles on the on the land that's the traditional sense of the triad and they are investing or about to invest uh, enormous amounts of money in nobody new, knows where it's coming from new platforms <laughs> well you know it, it is over 30 years and they will and and President Trump has already said in his budget that he's going to be allocating massively more money towards the Department of Defense so you know and Department of Energy so the, the money could be there Trump seems to be willing to sacrifice all sorts of things including the State Department in order to find that money but the problem is is that actually investing in these weapon systems which are after all in the end sim symbols symbols of power because in the end that you, you can't use them and, uh, until you've used them, and then it's and then they're gone. It's not a continuous. Well, the Russians have talked weapons. about limited nuclear strikes. Yes, and, 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 so that, that and really it's a fantasy. Ups the ante. It's a fantasy. Dangerous fantasy, maybe. But yes. for instance, one of the things they've done now is start using cruise missiles. Yes. The, deploying submarines, new submarines out there with what could be nuclear tipped yes. cruise missiles, and doesn't that break the rules? It, it does possibly break the rules. The point is that um, the international order, um, the politics does not understand that systems have changed. If you put the ethical argument aside, the situation we have now is very similar to the situation before the First World War. The rules of the game changed, but the rulers did not understand that. And that's why we had this catastrophic collapse, which forced the change. We're in very similar situations now, where there, is, uh, there are beliefs that you can use these weapons and win. What about the cruise missile danger? Yeah. Because, I mean, yeah. I know Andy Weber, who I know well, Assistant Secretary of Defense, we just interviewed uh, the former Secretary of Defense, William Perry, both saying cruise missiles are used in conventional conflict. Suddenly you yes. put nuclear arms yes. on them. The chance of mistake from one side or another, believing they could be under a nuclear attack, are scary. Uh, exactly. And, and, and then there's the question, if Russia ever... Uh, experiences a cruise missile attack from the from the Americans do they see these as do they see this immediately as a nuclear attack and then respond or vice versa and of course the Americans are developing a long-range standoff cruise missile air launched weapon uh, and and that will be ambiguous and a lot but of people they, calling for them to stop doing it they they they, they are and the, and this is this is the quality that that, that is shifting from uh, an, an ultimate deterrence posture towards a nuclear war fighting posture and the and the objective of achieving strategic dominance yeah, so last, last point to you I'm afraid we're out of time uh, the I mean this nuclear uh, this cruise missile issue is not without precedence we've had artillery shells with nuclear Indeed. tips in the past uh, and and so the problem isn't whether you can play around with little uh, options the problem is understanding the balance of power in the <coughs> modern world and deciding whether uh, even conventionally we can continue with power politics as we've known them or we're willing to change before we have a catastrophe that forces change. I agree. Yeah, we Absol. talked about North Korea in the, in the middle of that and how that upsets the, the balance of power. Absol, Paul, thank you so much for, for coming in and talking to us today. We end with our inside bite, a little something that we feel that you should know in a U.S. firm that is boldly going where no man or woman has gone before, but on a shoestring budget. The Silicon Valley space company Rocket Lab has completed a world first in space exploration, the launch of a 3D printed battery powered rocket. The launch took place on a remote New Zealand island after four years of preparation. In the age of space agency budget cuts, the new tech is being seen as an important step in breaking down the financial barriers to space exploration. That's all for now. I'm Dana Lewis, and that was Inside.